This is the Raza Summit 2021. So let's get started. Um, here we are. All right, first of all, welcome. Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. Um, especially if you're joining from an awkward time zone, if you've woken up early or you've stayed up late, um, thanks even more for, uh, for taking the time and making the extra effort. Welcome back if you've been joining us for the workshops for the first part of the week. Um, I hope you learned a lot and uh, we'll be putting that to use in the next couple of days. Um, we've got an absolutely fabulous selection of speakers uh, and panelists over the next few days. So I'm sure that you'll you know, learn a lot of new things and see a lot of wonderful things uh, from different people in the browser community. It's just a great chance for us all. Uh, to get together and learn from one another. And it's my great pleasure to give the you know, first talk kicking off this great uh, summit. And the topic will be scale and building conversational AI at scale in a team. So I'm assuming if you're here at the Raza Summit, you already know what Raza is. Um, so just one slide by way of introduction, right? Uh, Raza is an open source company. Uh, we build the standard infrastructure for conversational AI. I've been around for a little over four years and you know, I think if you had uh, asked me and other folks four years ago, um, it wouldn't have been obvious that, you know, the largest companies in the world across all sorts of different industries, right, healthcare, insurance, banking, et cetera, uh, would all be using the same horizontal open source infrastructure to be building mission critical applications, right? And I think that speaks to the strength of the community that we've built up and how much we've been able to learn from each other over the past four years that we've made all of that happen. And so what I'm talking about today is scale, and it's a lot of what we're observing working and, and what's not working when people are building you know, applications at enterprise scale with a huge number of users and all the complexity that that uh, brings. And so there's one idea that I would love for you to get into your head before you know, we start the rest of the talk. Um, and it's a very simple idea, and, and it's a very important one. So yes, there are lots of unsolved problems in conversational AI, and there are lots of things that are hard about it, and I think that's something we're, we're very vocal about at Raza. Um, and yes, they involve machine learning, right? And I think building products and applications which have machine learning at their core is, is quite a new thing, right? But that doesn't mean that we should just throw away everything we know about guild, building good products and building good software products, right? And so one theme of this talk is which things can we just port over, can we just copy and bring with us uh, and just make sure that we're doing them and which things do we have to rethink? Before we can you know, talk about all of that and what actually you know, makes sense and doesn't make sense, uh, the first thing I think we have to do is agree on what we mean when we talk about scale, right? It's a word that I use in many different contexts and I think people use the word scale to talk about all sorts of different issues. So let's get to the bottom of that first. Um, the first thing, very straightforward, right? If you have an assistant and it's doing its job, it's doing a great job, uh, you will naturally want to scale that to a larger user base, right? If you're helping users, you want to be able to help more of them, right? That's probably the most straightforward sense uh, in which these, these projects tend to scale. Um, but of course, if you're helping users do something, you're going to immediately ask yourself, well, what else can we help them do, right? We're going to scale in the sense of the, the range of capabilities of the assistance that we're building and uh, the amount of things that we're going to help people do. And then the surface area of your assistant also tends to increase over time, right? So you might start by building an assistant that lives in a chat widget on a website uh, that might get ported over to an in-app experience. Uh, and then very often we see this uh, showing up in the contact center, right? So that now it's not just in chat, but it's also in voice and people can call up and talk to the assistant. On top of that, you might be rolling it out in different countries where people speak different languages. And so the number of, of ways and places that people can access your assistant also increases the complexity and offers another kind of scale. And then the humans who are building these things, right? The, the, the teams that build conversational AI are very heterogeneous, right? We see that all the time. Uh, there are developers, there are data scientists, there are product owners, there are conversation designers, there are all sorts of folks. 
um, and they all have to work together. And then as they grow beyond that sort of two pizza size, um, you also have to coordinate work, right? And so you have these multiple heterogeneous teams having to coordinate, and that's another area and another sort of dimension of complexity that comes in. And then finally, of course, as you roll out, you know, in a larger organization, you're rolling out multiple assistants. Those are often going to have some kind of shared functionality, right? And so you might have uh, some things that all your assistants have in common, and you want to figure out, okay, how do we avoid everybody having to reinvent the wheel and do things over again? And how do we ensure that the shared pieces are consistent across all the uh, assistants that we're building in our organization? And so those are just some, I'm sure it's not comprehensive, but I think it's pretty good coverage of the, the things that people mean when they talk about scale, right? And all the different dimensions in which complexity naturally increases um, as the assistance that we build uh, gain some kind of success. And so how do we do that, right? How do we deal with all this creeping complexity without grinding to a halt? Right. How do we continue to move fast? How do we continue to evolve the assistance that we're building uh, and ensuring that we're you know, solving more problems for more people all the time? And so I'll start with a bit of good news <laughs> that we're not starting from scratch. Right. So a lot of these things have already been figured out and um, because a lot of these things are no different from building any other kind of software product at scale. And hopefully you're already doing many of these things, right? I mean, for example, if you're using Raza, you're almost certainly using version control, right? And you probably, hopefully, have a CI CD pipeline set up for deploying your assistant. Um, so I'm not talking about some kind of radical new things. I'm just talking about the basics, the foundations of, of shipping products in a reliable way. And most of these ideas, these are well-established ideas of, of how to ship reliably, most of these translate very well into building AI assistants. I say most because there are definitely some that don't. And I think that's, that's the meat of this talk is teasing those apart. Like which things can we copy over and we just have to make sure that we do them? And which things do we really have to rethink and reinvent? So here's a very incomplete list, but it covers, I think, some topics that we see coming up again and again of things which feel like you're making fast progress, especially in the early stages of an assistant, and the things which actually scale to help us you know, uh, continue to, to ship with high velocity when we're dealing with all this complexity coming in. right? And so rather than generating synthetic training data, we're learning from real conversations. Rather than using a black box tool that handles everything for us, we have customizable infrastructure that we can control. Rather than making edits and having changes go live right away, we have changes that go live automatically after a review and testing process. Rather than purely separating out code and content, we version the code and content together to ensure that everything is perfectly reproducible. And rather than composing pieces at runtime, we compose pieces at build time. And so I'm going to talk about each of these things and how we see them play out and what our view of these things is. Now, this first one, if you've joined you know, any training from Rasa, if you've read our documentation, you know, if you've had any interaction with us at all, you'll know this is something we advocate for very strongly, that your models should be trained on real data and not synthetic data. Right? Um, training models on synthetic data is a bad idea for two reasons. One, you're asking your model to make predictions about real data, real user messages, which are messy and noisy and difficult. And so if you're only training on synthetic data that doesn't look anything like the data you're asking it to make predictions about, your model is going to underperform. And secondly, if you're training and testing on synthetic data, you're going to trick yourself into thinking that you do have a good model, and you're not even going to notice all the problems that your model actually has in reality. So rather than asking yourself, OK, we don't have any training data at the start of this project, how do we you know, synthetically generate some, ask yourself, how can we, as quickly as possible, get a feedback loop set up so that we know we're annotating real messages and using those as the basis of our, uh, of our NLU model or whatever it might be? This piece 
you know, if you're at Raza Summit, I probably don't have to convince you of this, right? But of course, when you're building that first prototype, that first chatbot you ever build, it's very nice to have a, a tool that just hides all the details from you. You don't have to worry about how the NLP works or anything like that, right? Um, that's that's obviously wonderful. You don't want to fuss about that. You just want to prove out the, the concept, the prototype. And of course, very quickly, when you're getting to a more serious application, you start to think, well, maybe actually we want to have some control and we want to pick the model that's best for us, right? That's best for our application. And you want to be able to look under the hood and customize that. Or if you're really advanced, you might say, look, we're going to train our own embeddings and we're going to build our own, you know, really, really bespoke language model. At the same time, of course, we have you know, every six months or so, there's a new big language model that's the new cool thing. And you want to be able to keep with all, keep up with all those developments, or maybe there's a new language model release that's specific to your domain or to a language that you're expanding into. And so you want to be able to keep up with all those developments and use the latest things, right? And so having some kind of plug and play architecture uh, is really crucial. And these two points are really about the foundation of building reliable software, right? And I want to spend one or two minutes talking about these pieces. So there's a reason why all mission critical software that gets shipped in the world, you know, has tests, has a CI pipeline, right? The reason we write tests, the reason we run tests is to move faster, right? Because it means that when we want to build something new, we want to build a new feature, we can focus on building the new feature rather than fixing some bugs and regressions that we introduced the week before, right? And so it's really key to shipping at high velocity, especially as you know the complexity and sophistication of what you're building increases, it becomes more and more important, right? And of course, Raza, we're very vocal about ensuring that you write you know, test stories, you run through test stories, you check any changes you make, don't break things, right? And I've said this before, but I believe it very strongly, if a conversational AI platform doesn't support writing and running tests, then it's a prototyping tool, right? And there's nothing wrong with prototyping tools, they're just they're not fit for production. Um, and so rather than thinking of everything going live right away, you want to think about, okay, how do we integrate this into our CI CD pipeline, right? And of course, uh, as I already mentioned, Conversational AI is built by diverse teams, right? And it's not just developers and it's not just data scientists. So we also think about, okay, what tools do we build to empower others to contribute to the assistant, right? To change the copy, to annotate new data, to change how the conversation is supposed to go. But then making sure that those changes still go through, you know, make it back into Git or, you know, whatever version control system you're using. Um, and they go through your CI CD pipeline so that you know you're not breaking things, right? Similarly, on the topic of separating code and content, it's not about what tool you use to edit the responses, you know, which is typically something people describe as content, like the responses with, you know, GIFs and text and buttons and things. It's not about what tool you use. It's about how you version that, right? And ensuring, so in the case of Raza, you have a model, right? You have a, a zip of a, of a model, and that contains everything, that contains the responses and the, and the training data and the trained model. And you want to ensure that you have a single artifact, which is a perfectly reproducible version of your assistant, right? So that if you have to, you can do a rollback. And so you can build instrumentation on your, you know, your production deployment um, and know what changed at what time, right? And those are really just table stakes things for shipping a production quality piece of software uh, that are really foundational. And then the final point is about dealing with the complexity of having multiple teams, multiple assistants with shared functionality, right? So maybe you have two assistants that run in your organization uh, and they share like a login flow and some FAQs. And so the question is, how do we make sure that those are shared and consistent, and we're not having to duplicate that work, right? And so an idea we see kind of lots of different people exploring and asking us about is, okay, well, maybe the shared functionality, maybe we should deploy that as a separate service, right? Now that starts to look like a microservice architecture, but it's missing the one thing that makes it possible to build microservice architectures, which is enforcing adherence to a very strict API, right? If you're letting users kind of talk to different, you know, subbots or components or switch conversation topics all the time, users don't respect APIs. They don't think that way, right? And so you're imposing your structure on the end user. 
And you have all the complexity of the microservice architecture without the one thing holding it together that makes it possible to pull off. And so the way we think about, OK, how do you build reusable components? You can do that, and you can share those, but you combine them to build time, right? So that when you train your model, you can check nobody else has introduced an intent that clashes with yours. Nobody has you know, built a flow that clashes with how your conversation should be going. Um, you can run through end-to-end -end tests, and you can be robust, and you know that everything still works. Um, rather than having you know, complete chaos. And so everything so far has just been about complexity coming to you and scale coming to you and having to deal with it and keep up with it, right? But I'd like to sort of finish on a note of thinking about what does scale enable and what can we do that we couldn't do before? So something we talk about a lot at Raza is the five levels of AI assistance. Right. And from the end user perspective, the thread that connects these levels is that we're asking less and less of the end user to translate what they want into a language that we understand, into the language of, of our organization. Right. And we're more and more accommodating of our end user, of our customer, of their reality and the way that they see things. And so if we think about building something that scales, we want to build not just two or three or four AI assistants, but we want to build something that is greater than the sum of its parts, right? Rather than shipping our org chart and imposing our, our domain and our restrictions and our divvying up of the world on our end users, we can build a, an interface, a conversational natural language interface between a large and complex organization and a huge collection of customers, all of whom think about the world slightly differently, right? And we can build that translation layer and that means that we can meet customers where they are and speak their language. Right? And so I think that's why we're all here at this, at this summit, right? Everyone here, if there's a common thread between all these talks, it's that everybody's thinking about, okay, what can we build in the future? What is the really great thing that we can build for our organization, right? What is something that a team, when it's set up for scale, when it's you know, building and building at high velocity and building in a way that they're happy with, what can they achieve? Um, and so I think that's something to keep in mind and to take away uh, to think about for the next couple of days as you're thinking about, um, as you're taking in all the different talks, is what can you build for your organization that's going to be really transformative. So that's the end of the talk. Uh, I'm sure I'll have said some things that are controversial. So if you want to write me a long email uh, about how I'm wrong about everything, uh, feel free to do so. And I'll just finish by saying, you know, enjoy the summit. Um, there are a lot of great speakers, a lot of great attendees. Um, you know, enjoy yourself, ask good questions, be kind to each other, and uh, enjoy. Thanks.